Good to be in the house of the Lord. How many are excited about serving God? I am thrilled about the fact that something is about to crack. Amen? That ceiling that separates heaven and earth is about to crack. I had someone tell me one time, being a Christian ain't what it's cracked up to be, and I said, oh, yes, it is. If you like the right cracks in the right place, amen. I had someone else tell, them, tell me that um, being a Christian wasn't no barbecue, and I said, going to hell ain't no barbecue either, amen. All right, I want you to open your Bibles with me, please, to St. Mark chapter 2, verse 4. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. St. Mark chapter 2, beginning with verse 4. We're going to read one verse, and then we'll be preaching from this beautiful, uh, miraculous miracle that Jesus performed. And I love to see Jesus perform. How about you? I'd like to see him do some performing in my life and in your life, even tonight. Praise God. Uh, Verse 4 And when they, that's speaking of four godly men, could not come nigh unto Jesus for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, notice the word, they let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy lay. Notice verse four says, they could not get in because of people having the house filled. They uncovered the roof where Jesus was, and when they had broken up the roof, they let down the sick of palsy down to the feet of Jesus Christ. I'm glad there's still some days in the church of Jesus Christ. How about you? I want to use for a subject tonight, raising the roof. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. I love this uh, beautiful picture. Um, Jesus is preaching away. And he's sharing the good news of God. And I believe that in that house, he was raising the roof with the word of God. I think every time we get in the house of the Lord, we ought to be raising the roof, amen? And as Jesus preached the word of God, he was raising the bar. He was raising the the expectation of the people. I'm thankful for the fact that God has a message of encouragement for you and I in this cruddy, clumsy, discouraging world. The Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to see Jesus was preaching and raising the roof. What was he doing? He was raising the people's hopes high. He was raising the people's excitement higher. He was, people were getting pumped up on God. How many know that We ought to see more people in church get pumped up on God. And as Jesus preached the word of God, people were getting pumped up on God. They were getting excited about God because Jesus went into the house, and this was Simon Peter's house, uh, they tell us, and Jesus is preaching the word of God. And I don't know about you, but when the preaching is, is preached the way it should be, and God is honored the way he should be honored, there should be a rejoicing in the midst of God's people. And Jesus, when he preached the word of God, he showed them that God was not a God of hate, but a God of love. And that God wanted to heal them that were sick. God wanted to bless them that were cursed. God wanted to raise them up that were down low. That God wants to be a blessing to you. And let me tell you, friends, when we start preaching to a world that God wants to be a blessing to them and that Jesus took their cursing on the cross of Calvary, Jesus took their curse on the cross of Calvary, and because Jesus Christ nailed it all to the cross of Calvary and went to the grave and rose again from the grave, and today he is our mediator between us and God the Father. And so Jesus is preaching and he's sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of God. And he's telling the world that they need to understand that God is not their problem. You know, we live in a world that actually believes God is their problem. We live in a world that believes religion is a problem. Well, I have to get on the front line and and get right up there in front and say, I will agree with that. Religion is a problem. 
But Jesus is not a problem. Jesus is an answer. He's the answer to our needs. He's the answer to our, our hopes and dreams. Jesus is the answer to eternal life. And Jesus was preaching in that house. And how many know that the Bible's very clear that the house filled up? Because people were getting pumped up on God. People were getting excited about God. They were, their, their expectations was being raised high. And their dreams and their desire and their faith of a better tomorrow was being raised high. And I believe with all my heart that the gospel raises people up. And it brings them to a place that they'll understand that Jesus went way, way, way down low so that you and I could go way, way, way up high. And Jesus was preaching in the house and the Bible says the house packed out. I mean, I believe that it was so full that people were standing on each other's toes. I believe that place was so full that there was probably children sitting on top of the, the shoulders of the men. And I believe that it was so crowded that they didn't care about B.O. They were in the presence of S.O., spiritual odor. They, they didn't care about, uh, about bad breath. They didn't care about who had on what and who looked like what. It didn't matter. God showed up. And I want you to know it doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter to us when God shows up. When God shows up and the house is filled, people are there to see Jesus. They're not there to see what the other person's wearing. They're not there to, to smell the other person's breath. Now, they may, they may very well smell their breath, and they may very well smell it from one end of the room to the other room, but it doesn't matter when Jesus is there. I can smell a lot of breath, amen, as long as the breath of God is in the house of the Lord. And I am so grateful for the fact that Jesus was preaching in the house. What was he doing? He was bringing to the people who God is and what God wants to do in their life. And oh, how we need that kind of preaching today. Telling people who God is and what God wants to do in their life. And Jesus Christ came to break those shackles of unbelief. He came to disintegrate those things that stand between us and God. He came to pull down the walls and lift up a standard of the goodness of God and the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. And so Jesus was preaching and he was raising the roof, amen. I mean that room got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Verse one, chapter two, St. Mark, and again. I love that. In the Bible, you'll find those two words, and again. That means Jesus is not finished yet. And again. <laughs> and I love it, because I've got, a, 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 I've got a, a, a source of preaching material that will never end, and again. And again, I find God big. And again, I find God healing. And again, I find God reaching. And again, I find God moving. And the Bible says, and again, Jesus entered into Capernaum after some days. How many ever had some of them days? Some days. America's having some days. Are you listening to me? I've been in some of them some days. <laughs> I've been in some of them days, it's not good days, some days. Boy, some days are dark. Some days are, are, are trouble. Some days are wearisome. Some days are tired and gloomy. Some days are, are, are just more than we can hardly stand. But here in this verse one, it is not some days that's negative. It is some days where Jesus, is, man, there was some days when he was raising the dead from the grave. It was some days when he was cleansing the leper. It was some days when he was opening blinded eyes. It was them some days that Jesus was doing so much powerful stuff and touching so many people's lives that he entered into Capernaum. And after some days of healing the sick and raising the dead and opening the blinded eyes, the Bible says that it was noised abroad or noise that Jesus was in the house. I believe that it went across Capernaum and into the other villages around about Capernaum. 
Do you know where Jesus is? He's over at Simon Peter's house. Do you know what Jesus is doing? He's a preaching. He's a sharing things we ain't ever heard before. Hey, we heard that God loves us. Hey, we heard that God cares about us. Hey, we heard that God is up to do us good and not do us harm. And Jesus is raising the roof in that place. And while he's raising the roof and the voice is going out, and let me say this, God's people need to understand that the breath of God wants to live inside of you, us, as children of God. God wants to breathe inside of us. In the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, it was a tent. And Peter said that we live in a tabernacle, a tabernacle of flesh. And Peter talks about putting off the old tabernacle and putting on the new. And Jesus talks about if this tabernacle is dissolved, we have a house in heaven. We have a place in heaven. And so you need to understand that I'm preaching to a, a, a church full of folks that are tents. You're just a tent. You live in a tent. Are you listening to me? You live in a tent. You say, what are you doing? Well, you're camping out. Jerry's camping out in that tent. I'm camping out in my tent. Dave's camping out in his tent. My tent's starting to get a few tears. My tent's starting to lose a few slats. It's starting to lose a few uh, uh, things that hold it up. And when my tent crumbles, then I find a new place to dwell. But the tabernacle where the tent was, where God was in the Old Testament across the wilderness and going across in the ta tabernacle, that was a tent. It was made of a tent. And I am told that that tent, as the wind would come, that tent actually looked like it was breathing. And God chose to have a tabernacle in the wilderness that is a picture of you and I walking through this world as a tent where God dwells inside of you and I. Amen. I'm glad God's breathing inside me. If God wasn't breathing inside me, I'd be graveyard dead right now. But God makes me expand. Don't blame me for how wide I'm expanding. God's in there. Well, I'm not, I'm not heavy set. I'm not big. What about me? Well, you shouldn't be cramping God up so much. Expand. <laughs> I never want to forget what the little girl said to the Sunday school teacher. If God can live in my heart, if God created the universe. If God's so big, he loves the world. If God's so big, he holds all the people in his hand. If God's so big, he holds the mountains and the, and the stars and the universe in his hand. And I'm so little, if God's in me, wouldn't he be sticking out some places? Amen. And I'm glad that God is sticking out in some places in my life. <laughs> Amen, come on now. I'm glad that God's sticking out in some places in my life. And I'm speaking spiritually, of course. I'm not speaking carnally. But, but you, thank you, Chuck. I appreciate that. Stand with me, Chuck. Stand with me. The guy in the back, you can't trust him, but I, I can. But anyway, but Jesus is preaching. I mean, they are pumped on God. I mean, they are turned on. I mean, they are wrapped up about God because Jesus has been preaching the word of God and they are excited about their future. They are excited about what God is about to do. They are excited of what, about what Jesus has said. And you know what? I'm excited about what Jesus has said. And I'm excited about what Jesus is about to do. And I'm excited about this world and what's going to happen. I'm excited. It's a noise abroad and we need the noise abroad that Jesus Jesus is in this house. Jesus is in your house. Jesus is in your life. Jesus is in your mind, your heart, your soul, your spirit. Amen. And he's breathing with power. Number two, one man, one was brought bound with the palsy. 
Verse three, Mark two, and they came unto Jesus, bringing one sick of palsy, which was born afore. That word born means he was carried before people. The Bible says this one sick of the palsy, and I don't know when he got the palsy, I don't know when he got sick, whether it happened as a child or whether it happened later on in his life. But let me tell you, friends, being bed fastened is one of the most horrific, one of the most depressing, one of the most discouraging things. That if you're not sick before you get in a hospital bed, you will be shortly after. And if that don't kill you, the hospital bill will. But I'm just trying to say that this man was sick in his bed. He was ready to die. He was, they probably had the bathing. They, I'm sure they changed his clothes. I mean, he wasn't able to walk. He was in a bed, a sick of palsy, and there he was in a bad shape. No doubt his, his flesh was getting, getting shrunken and he was losing his weight and, and he was, I think he was setting I, I can't prove this, but I believe his eyes were already setting in death. His eyes were already being set to die. I believe his mind was already being programmed to die. You say, preacher, you're gonna die? No, my mind ain't programmed for that. Amen. You're in trouble when you start programming your mind to die. And, and I'm not gonna do that because Jesus programmed my mind to live. But that man, sick of palsy, he's laying in that bed. He's, 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 Horrific pain, no doubt. He's totally discouraged. And those four men, the Bible says he was carried to four. Those four men, those four God men, those four faith men, those four men of love, men of God, men of strength, men of character. And when I say men, ladies can do the same because in, in the church there's neither male nor female, but we're just talking here about these four men. That's, I, I can't rewrite the story. Uh, it just says four men carried the sick of palsy to Jesus. And when they got to the house, it was so full that they couldn't even get in the door. All them good Baptists had it all filled up. All them good Pentecostals had it all filled up. All them good lawyers and, and Pharisees and scribes had it all filled up. All them good full gospel folks had it all filled up. All them religious folks had it all filled up. Them Pharisees, them Sadducees, they were all, that house was just filled up. But I do believe there was a great percentage of people wanting to hear from God. And that place was just full, packed. They couldn't get in. I believe there was a line backed up for probably I don't know, maybe a hundred feet, maybe a line backed up for miles, just wanting to get in. Just a line backed up for miles. People standing, been waiting for hours and hours just to meet the Son of God, and no one would come out. They were all there, and everybody had the attitude that you and I would have. Bless God, I found him, I ain't leaving. And they stayed in the house. And those four men of God, they carried the sick of palsy to where Jesus was. And when they got to the house, the house was full. Now that man that was in that bed, he was bedfast. And I know a lot of people that are fastened in sin. They're bed fastened in sin. I, I, spiritually, I know a lot of people that are bed fastened in guilt. There are people bed fastened in, in drugs and bed fastened in, in the ways of the world, the lust of the world. And somebody needs to go to them and tell them, there is a better world in the one you're living in. It's called the Christian world. There's a better world than the one you're living in. It's called an abundant world. It's called a God-loving, caring world. We need to let a world out there know that there is a world, a better world than what they're living in. They're living in and existing. They're just trying to exist. They're just trying to make it from one paycheck to the next. And uh, uh, pardon me and don't get upset with me with what I'm about to say, but I think they need to close down all them check cashing places because what happens is these guys cash their checks two or three times at a head and they work all week long and never get a check. It just goes to somebody else high interest. And they need to put an end to that. Are you listening to me? And, and by the way, you need to put an end to that and you need to learn 
the plan of God and learn how to manage your money and learn how to let God do things in your life. I'm not a rich man. I don't have a lot of money, but I can tell you this, God can manage my life. He has managed my life and God will take care of you too. You just gotta get everything in the right order. We've got the horse behind the cart and we're too busy picking up what they leave behind to spend any time going anywhere. Come on, that's good preaching. Say, preacher, this is Wednesday night. I wasn't expecting this. Well, just chip, p- p- perk up your ears and listen because you're going to get it just the way the Lord shoveled it out to me, amen. But those four men, they go and, and they get to that house and Jesus has raised the roof. I mean, there is hope, there is joy. That place is busting with glory. That place is throbbing with the presence of God. Those four men carry that sick of palsy and they can't get in. There's a crowd everywhere. And those four men looked around and said, you know what, let's just climb up on the roof and let's just break the tiling up and let's just make a hole and let's lower our sick friend down to the roof Let's bypass the back, the people lined up in the back. Let's bypass the crowd and let's go right up on top and let's just break up the roof and let's just let our friend down to the feet of Jesus. And I can just see it now. Jesus is preaching away and a piece of tiling falls from the ceiling. Jesus is just preaching away. And all of a sudden a piece of tiling just about to fall on Jesus. He just steps over. I mean, he is the son of God. He knows everything. (laughs) <laughs> and they get that hole and I can just see, they have portraits of this and they're, they're incredible where, where Jesus is looking up at the ceiling, there's a big old hole up there and there's four guys looking down like this and those, those are beautiful portraits but not as beautiful as this chapter two of St. Mark and, and these four men brought their loved one to Jesus Christ and, and because they couldn't get in for the crowd, they broke up the roof these four believing men got together. These four God men got together and they went after that hopeless, that, that sin, uh, that, that sick man and, and brought him. You say, how do you know he was not just sick? How do you know he was sinful? Because Jesus Christ told him, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. So it's pretty obvious he was a sinner too. Now that's bad to be sick and be a sinner too. Amen? And so their access to Jesus was challenged. You know, I've lived a Christian life for about 38 years, and my whole Christian life has been challenged. It really has. Mark chapter 2, verse 4, and when they, don't miss these four days. They could not get in. And when they uncovered the roof where Jesus was, and when they had broken the roof up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy lay. How many days are they? I just counted, counted them while I was preaching. God just give this to me while I was preaching. They said, there's one, two, three. Is that right? Four. Right, Amen. If there's another day day in there, it's out there where you're sitting. But they had something in their way. Stop and think about it. Are there things in your way? Of course there is. There's things in my way. And sometimes it's not just things in their way. People was in their way. And sometimes people get in your way. Sometimes you've got to call them relatives. Are you listening to me? People get in your way. You call them sometimes mother-in-laws. Don't go there. Don't go there. When my mother-in-law went to go to be with Jesus and, and we had the funeral here and it was a glorious funeral and because she was a Christian, she loved the Lord and I miss her. 
Uh, don't tell her that, but I miss her. And, and, and you know, she, you couldn't ask for a better granny, a better uh, mother-in-law, wonderful lady. Loved the Lord Jesus Christ with all her heart. And she, and she said to me, I want you to preach my funeral. I said, I'll do that. Be glad to do that. And she said, no jokes. No mother-in-law jokes. Did I obey her? Have I ever? <laughs> but, you know, sometimes people are in your way. Sometimes the past is in your way. Sometimes the heartbreaks is in your way. Sometimes guilt is in your way. Sometimes a lack of confidence is in your way. They're, they're just things that get in your way. You know what you need to do when there's things in your way? When people are in your way. When things are in your way. When guilt is in your way. When the past is in your way. When trouble's in your way. You know what you need to do? You need to find three friends. Three friends. And then you'll have a quartet that can sing. Are you listening to me? Come on now. Find you some people that you can stand with and get yourself together and come up with a plan. I am not going to get out of church. I am not going to get away from prayer. I am not going to get away from serving God. I am not going to slip and stumble. I am going to bring others to Jesus Christ. I'm going to carry my corner of the stretcher. I'm going to carry my corner of the load. Just like those four men carried their corner of the load. I'm going to carry my load and someone else's load that can't carry their own load. And I want you to know, if you as children of God, including myself, would spend more time worried to help someone else, desiring to help someone else, you wouldn't be and I wouldn't be near as lonely sometimes. Come on now. I'm preaching better than you're responding. They broke up the roof. They brought that man to Jesus. They lowered that man down to the feet of Jesus. They brought the palsy man to Jesus Christ. And in verse five, Mark chapter two, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, when they got to that house, I'm getting to the good part. When they got to that house and they couldn't get in, they envisioned a door in the roof. They said, you know what? This house has a door in front and it may have had a back door, I don't know, I doubt it, but it, I know it had a front door because it says they were so many about the door. And I believe those four men said to each other, you know what? It's only got one door, but why don't we just make another one? Come on. And so they go up on the roof because they envision a doorway in the roof. Where Jesus was raising expectations, where Jesus was raising the roof, they now are going to make a doorway there. And they make a doorway. They envision a doorway above. They break the tile and they lower their friend down to that doorway. And as they lower their friend down to the feet of Jesus, those loving, those caring, those believing men of God, they take their loved one, those four God-loving men, and those men that love their friend, they envision a doorway above and they lowered that loved one down to the feet of Jesus. And when they lowered that, let me say this, not a door way out. They were not building a doorway out, but a doorway in. And so they opened the door and it was a doorway in, a doorway into God's favor. 
a doorway into God's power, a doorway into a miracle, a doorway into encouragement, a doorway into healing, a doorway into forgiveness, a doorway into love, a doorway into Jesus Christ. And instead of being a problem, they became an answer. And everyone in this room ought to say to yourself, I don't want to ever be a problem. I want to be an answer. I want to be a blessing to those around me. I want to help those around me. Amen? You see, you got those, the house was full. Jesus was raising the roof. And I'm sure that there was them scribes and Pharisees that said, well, where's the holiness here? Glory to God. It's too noisy in this room. Glory to God. We need silence and quietness. I think it was everything but quiet when Jesus was preaching. Amen? So well, Jesus didn't like it loud. You don't have any eye. You say, Gee, you say, you can't prove me that prove to me that Jesus didn't that Jesus liked it loud. I can. The Bible says he cried with a loud voice. And the Bible also says that when he wanted to really have a good amplification, he'd go to the seashore and he would get in a boat and he would cause his words to ricochet off the waters. I used to fish. My dad had a fish boat. We'd go out on the water and we'd be fishing and enjoying ourselves and, and I'd be talking away and my brothers would be talking away and my dad would say, shh, they can hear you back there at the camp. I'd say, Dad, we're, we're two miles away. He said, they can hear you back at the camp. I didn't believe him. I just went on talking. I said something about Mama, that Mama can't fish. Mama maybe could fish when she was younger, but she can't fish anymore. We got to the campgrounds. I walked up through there and Martha Jane put her hands on her two hips and she says, James, I can fish too. <laughs> now she heard me. And I believe there was people in that room that didn't like it. Oh, it's too crowded. We don't have a place to sit. It's too noisy. It's, it's too exciting. It, you know, and it, it makes me nervous. Crowds make me nervous. You better stay out of heaven or pray for a very good body that can handle it because you're going to have crowds in heaven. I'd hate to think that I'm going to go to heaven and look around. There's only three or four people sitting in the room. Josh and I went to see a movie the other night, and it was a clean movie, by the way. We didn't go see something dirty. We went into the movie, we sat down, and I looked around, and there was one old geezer up at the top, and if he's watching me on television, there's one handsome, wonderful guy up there. And he was sitting up there, and I said, Josh, maybe we're in the wrong place. There's only just me and you and that guy. But it was a good movie. But when I get to heaven, I don't want to sit down in this vast auditorium and look around and say, there's only me and Jerry here. Where's the rest of them? We got the wrong room. I'm sure you heard the story about the Church of Christ people that went to heaven. Some of them were born again, went to heaven. And this guy's walking through heaven. He said, here's the Pentecostal room. Man, they're shouting, they're praising God. Walk right out of the room, them Baptists in their room. They're going, amen, 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 amen. Like good Baptists. And went, by the, went by the Methodists and they were... Glory, hallelujah, and they're singing the docks all day. And then they went by this one room, and it's just really quiet. It was full. And the guy that was showing them around heaven says, Shh, be real quiet. Don't say nothing. Tip behind the door. Tip your toe by. That's Church of Christ, and they don't know we're here. <laughs> well, I want to be there. I want to go to heaven. And I'm going there because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going there because of the power of God Almighty. And they envision a doorway. Not out, but in. And I envision a doorway into heaven. His name is Jesus Christ. I envision a doorway into forgiveness. I envision a doorway that's going to take me into the very presence of God 
a doorway into God's purpose, a doorway into God's everlasting life, a doorway into forgiveness, a doorway into the house of God, a doorway into the Son of God. And I want to encourage you tonight. Invite someone to your world. The world where you live with God. Invite someone into your world. Because you see, it's easy to find fault. It's easy to look around and criticize. I'm sure the Pharisees, in fact the Pharisees and scribes are responsible with a lot of other people for crucifying the Son of God. Amen? You know, they weren't very nice to Jesus. He was a holy, wonderful son of God, God in flesh, and they crucified him. You get good like him, and they'll do you that way. Amen. And I just want to say, invite people into the presence of God and understand that there's always going to be critics. I've been criticized for everything. I've been criticized for dressing too nice. Then I've been criticized for dressing down. Then I've been criticized for wearing tennis shoes with a suit jacket. I've never been criticized for preaching barefooted because I didn't want to kill people with the odor. I've been criticized for preaching too long. I've been criticized for preaching too short, believe it or not. I've been criticized for being too loud. I've been criticized for not being loud enough. I've had people tell me I can't hear you in the back. I've been criticized. I even got criticized one day. He said, you sweat too much. What's the matter with you? Sweat all the time. I've been criticized for a lot of things. In fact, I got criticized one time for being a Jesus preacher. See, every time I go to church, that's all he talks about is Jesus this and Jesus that, Jesus this and Jesus that. Don't he know anything but Jesus? No, I don't really. Don't want to know anything but Jesus. If I'm going to preach things that's not about Jesus, I'm going to have to get the New York Times or the Chicago Press or something and read articles to you. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to preach the word of God. But I've been criticized for a lot of things. Pharisees criticized Jesus. The Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. But anyway, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in miracles. And Jesus came along and just did them right in front of their unbelieving eyes. Boy, that went over good. How dare him do something that doesn't agree with my religious beliefs? And Jesus came along and did a lot of things that didn't agree with their religious beliefs. But I believe in Jesus. Scott, I believe in Jesus. And I believe that if this church is ever criticized, I'd rather it be criticized for being a Jesus church. A Jesus church. Because Jesus is my Savior, I shall not be moved. And I just want to encourage you tonight, Josh is going to come and bring a song. And if you're in this room right now and you say, well, preacher, my world isn't really, my world isn't really a Jesus world. Would you come tonight and say, I want to be introduced to this Jesus world, this God world. Maybe you're in this room right now and you say, preacher, I'm a Christian, but I'm not happy. I'm I'm a Christian, but I'm, I'm beaten down. I'm discouraged. I want to encourage you to come and just put things in order. Put things in order in your life and just say, you know what? Let's do it the way God wants it done. Let's just do it the way God wants it done. Josh preached a phenomenal message here the other day. He says, you know what to do. You know how to do it and you know when to do it. And that was a phenomenal message. It's pretty simple, we know what to do. We know what to do and we know where to do it. And so the question I guess I ask you tonight is, how's your world going? Envision a door open in heaven. Envision a world 
that only Jesus is supreme and King of kings and Lord of lords. All I got to say is when Jesus returns, and he will return, when Jesus returns, and he will, there's going to be a lot of politicians very upset because they're going to find out they're not the potentate. They're not in control. Jesus is. And I'd just soon be on the right side. How about you? Amen. Just want to be on the right side. Altar's open. Stand with me. Josh's going to sing. We invite you. Terry's going to play the piano. We invite you to come. Altar's open. We always give an altar call no matter the service. We always invite people to come and pray. Altar's open for you. You come. We 